then Michael, we are live. Let's go. <laughs> I love doing this. How you doing, Martin? I am doing awesome. What about you, Michael? I don't think in this case I'm doing as well as you are. Just refresh my memory. Where are you now? Yeah, we are. I, I'm currently in France, in Epanay, in the capital of Champagne. I'm sorry, guys. I didn't. I did not bring some Champagne on the show because I thought of drinking alcohol would not be very appropriate. <laughs> oh my god, it's but, so selfish. <laughs> but we got tons of Champagne here. That's awesome for Christmas time. <laughs> oh my god, broadcasting live from France and from Champagne. From, from Champagne, exactly. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Martin, let's welcome our guest, Valentin Radu. Hopefully I pronounced your name right. The founder and CEO of OmniConvert to e-commerce undercover. Valentin, how are you doing? Uh, Michael, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm great. I'm finishing uh, the, the year properly and I'm uh, happy to be with, uh, with you, Martin and Michael. Welcome, so I'm Valentin. jealous. I, yeah, it's great to have you here. I'm jealous. I'm not normally jealous. I'm not a jealous person, but... Your tech guy, whoever he is, <laughs> has built an incredible setup for you. Can you do that thing really quickly where you switch the camera to the other view? <laughs> yeah. See, that's, that's what I love. <laughs> Using the A10 Mini for what it was intended. That is so awesome. It's great to have you here. I love this, actually. And, and Valentin, where are you based? I'm in Bucharest, Romania. I love this. So I am talking to people in Romania and in France. And I'm in yeah. Bangkok. This has got to be the most exotic podcast I've ever done. <laughs> <laughs> this is super cool, definitely. <laughs> it's super cool. So, Valentin, now that we know where you're from, why don't you give us a little bit more of your background? And then I want to talk a little bit about OmniConvert and more, more broadly, just like e-commerce in general. Uh, of course. So I'm a, a former poor kid from uh, Bucharest, Romania. I was uh, being uh, born in the communism. I've uh, I've had this struggle to 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 demonstrate to my father that I'm uh, I'm gonna do the right thing in life, and I I managed to to build companies. I've started when I was uh, back in my twenties. I was playing StarCraft all day long, and we had only dial-up connection. And eventually, I that turned out to be one of the first uh, internet service providers in Bucharest. Then sold that company, failed completely with the other one. I got to back, go back to my father and he told me, I, I told you so, because he had this mentality from, from the communism era that you, you, you don't do entrepreneurship. I mean, it's bad, you know, it's like you, you, you don't get in front of people because you're going to expose yourself. And his, his way to protect me was to simply not let me go out there. Anyways, the, the third company was an e-commerce company. We, we were selling uh, online car insurance. We were comparing prices and we, we, we showed the, the best prices on the insurance market. We got to grow that company. Uh, we grew it to 250,000 customers, made the exit from that, learned a lot about conversion rate optimization and all that things regarding to e-commerce growth and uh, built the last company, which is uh, OmniConvert with the purpose of helping other e-commerce uh, entrepreneurs like I was not to struggle anymore with, the, with paying a lot of money to acquire customers that never come back or to acquire traffic, which is not converting. So in a nutshell, that's, uh, that's who am I. So this is a really interesting story, particularly for someone like I am that grew up in the United States, that grew up during the Cold War, to actually meet somebody who's, you know, there's this idea that if you're living in a communist country, you f you're feeling oppressed. And your dad is basically telling you there is no oppression, there's planning, or it's safer, and that what you're doing is somehow bad. And it was interesting what you said, like, you know, I want to show my dad that it wasn't bad. And when I failed, he was like, see, I told you. <laughs> it's just an interesting way to grow up. No, it's just interesting. And I'm not making a political commentary about it at all, because frankly, I don't care about that. I care more about the human side. But I think it's fascinating that from generation to generation, it goes like, you know, your dad grew up in communism. It sounds like he believed in it, which is perfectly acceptable, right? And you just said, yeah. I'm not doing that. I want to build stuff from scratch. But where did you get like the technical expertise? And I'm really curious why you essentially built an insure tech company. I do an entire podcast. I've done 150 episodes of a podcast about insure tech. I'm curious why you went into the insurance market. Like, what did you see? Was it just in Romania? Was it pan-European? I'm really curious. 
Yeah, so um, I had a former uh, client, which um, he was passionate about insurance. And uh, I told him, why don't you build them? Why don't you sell them online? And he said, well, I'm selling them. But it was a freaking web page with a car which was spinning in Flash, if you remember. Yeah, Flash. Adobe Macromedia <laughs> Flash. And he had all these prices over there. And I said, man, you're not going to sell anything with this website. And he couldn't <laughs> afford to, to hire me as a, because I had this uh, small agency. And eventually we made a barter. And eventually we, I made a contract which was so solid that I became the, co I, I, I've co-founded the, the company, actually. That's and great. The the reason that we got I got over there is that I was playing with AdWords and I was looking at the bidding in uh, in the UK market and they had the market was far ahead than it was here in Romania there was no player in Romania so we 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 got online we made a lot of crazy stuff and uh, we managed to penetrate the market quite rapidly. And you, did you say you exited that company? Like who bought it? Did an insurance company buy it? Did another small brokerage buy it? What was the, what was the exit there? Yeah, the exit was uh, actually, I, I, I made the exit way, uh, way further than I've, I've got out of the, of the company. So mainly I got bought out by my, by my former uh, co-founder because we had different visions about growth. So mainly we, I, I secured an investment. And he wasn't agreeing to 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 go regionally because I, I had these global uh, ambitions, let's say regional right. ambitions. That's cool. That's that's super cool. Yeah, that's super cool. So you said you also use this terminology. What was it called? Like conversion rate optimization. And I think one of the things that I've learned, and one of the things that I talk about a lot is that almost everything in life is a conversion problem. Everything. And I'm not just talking about e-commerce. Yeah. I'm not just talking... I think dating's a conversion problem. I think marriage is a conversion yes. problem. <laughs> marriage is more of a problem than a conversion problem. But it's still a conversion <laughs> problem. <laughs> but you understand what I mean? Like, what did it take for you to figure out this conversion? That conversion was key. And then how do you optimize it? And, and you can talk broadly about it because I'm really curious. Yeah, I, I must tell you a story, Michael and Martin, and for, for you who are listening. So I was 17 years old and I've understood the principles of conversion rate optimization like this. Uh, I was really, really poor. So imagine that in high school, I couldn't afford to buy a pretzel. So it, it, I was really, really poor, you know, and I, I was struggling. And I think the struggling, it's, uh, it's a blessing for the ones which are getting it uh, and, and that, that are really trying to, to get a, out of that situation. So I was dating a girl and I, I couldn't afford to go to the seaside with her, but, but she said yes. And, and now the money was my last problem. So I got a temp job by selling cookbooks on the street. You know, it was a famous chef here in, uh, in Romania. He was selling uh, uh, cookbooks and he, he had this uh, direct selling approach. So I got into, into this thing. The, the books were like this and they were really expensive for that time. So imagine me carrying those freaking five books. Everyone laughed at me. I mean, the, the, the performance was two maximum per day for all the, the sales reps over there. Right. So I've managed to sell these books because I've tried to diversify my messaging. So I've identified the fact that you need different targeting. So I was, I was trying the, the young folks, the, uh, the moms, and eventually I've managed to understand that the the old ladies with their nephews sitting in the bus stations were my ideal customer profile <laughs> because they couldn't run away from me, and they, they 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 needed to stay there in the bus station. So I've adapted the messaging afterwards, and I've sold something like eighteen cookbooks eventually, and I got to the seaside, and that was my training on on the fact that is. It's about the messaging and framing, and of course, identifying the right uh, target. That, that's that's really interesting that you say that because, like, sometimes when we only do online businesses, when we only you know are on our computer and try to do ads and and drive traffic to to the website, we tend to forget that at the end of the day, it's real people who are coming on our website. So starting right. selling and marketing and identifying your ideal customer and all of that in the real world by really going to sell some stuff, I guess that really, really helped a lot in understanding, as you say, like the, the ideal customers, the, the messaging and all of that kind of 
kind of things. And not a lot of people do that and understand that this connection between, let's say, the offline world and the and the online world. How was your day at the beach, by the way? <laughs> Extraordinary. <laughs> 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 I'm sure it was, but I think that day at the beach actually probably made it was a lot more extraordinary for a bunch of different reasons. Not the least of which was you were poor and you really had no right to go to the beach. I mean, you had the right to go, but you had no right really being there because you couldn't afford it, but you wanted it. So you figured out a way to do it. And I think this is, I don't want to make too many connections here, but I think it's a real sign of entrepreneurship. I have a problem. I know that a solution is selling. I don't know how to sell. I'm going to figure out how to do that because I really want to go to the sea with this lady. And you yeah. did it. But I think it's informative, right? Because as you go through life, first of all, if you're lucky, you don't get poor again. But also you remember that feeling of not having and it should drive you to do more. I grew up very poor as well. And it's driven me my entire life to be able to get to here. Like there's no reason why I should be here. And the same reason why there's no reason why you should have like an, a an ATEM camera switcher, <laughs> a really nice SM7B and a beautiful <laughs> background. I'm not kidding though. Like it's funny to think about, but in, in reality, it's not that funny. And actually you're coming out of communism too. So there are a lot of things playing against you, but what a real entrepreneur does is figure out through conversion, through testing multiple things, how to solve that problem. Is that fair? Yeah, that's, that, that's absolutely uh, true, Michael. And uh, another aspect, another angle that I want to share about this thing is that it's uh, the, the fear, the fear about failure, the fear about rejection is always there, but it's transforming itself, you know? And, and you have this dance with the fear because eventually I, I, I felt like I'm not belonging to any place you know i don't have any right. kind of tribe i'll be i i'm a, alone against the world and eventually you build your tribe but you have other freaking fears so it's never ending this uh, this story it's just that the, you you got acquainted with it and eventually you understand that this is actually good fear is good because otherwise you'll be too comfortable and you end up i don't know uh in a plateau without reaching your true potential and uh, life has taught me that there's always more. There's always more. There's always more. I mean, when I when I got my first race, when I, I, I had 17 different jobs, I was amazed and I felt, wow, I made it. So what else can I do now that I've got it? You know, what's the next step? <laughs> right. Yeah. It's a, it's a super interesting concept. And I think the fear never goes away. I woke up, I had a meeting this morning at seven o'clock. And I'm normally awake at six, but I don't normally have meetings. And a meeting, you know, we talked about it. We, you know, we joked about your studio and about your microphone and about the background and about the camera switcher. But the reason why you do it is not just to have the coolest technology. It's because the presentation that you give is a window into your professionality, into how professional you are. And being able to switch the camera is just a level above and you can do that and people will think this guy is serious about this thing. But I woke up this morning at five for the same reason. I wanted to make sure I wasn't late. I wanted to make sure I was prepared. And because there's always more to do, I wanted to make sure that the meeting went the way I wanted it to go. And I know that I can control that, but it's all about preparation, right? And presentation. And you're right. That fear never goes away. Yeah. That's right. So you said something interesting as well earlier. You said, I learned all these things and I wanted to teach other people how to do it. So it's not a natural progression, right? Going from starting a couple of your own companies, some of them succeed, some of them fail. Maybe your yeah. dad's still in the background going, come on, dude, really? What are you doing? <laughs> kind of thing. He's That's a just a joke. No, I'm sure he's super. I'm sure he's super duper. And I'm sure he's very proud of you. I just wanted to joke about it. That, that's a... <laughs> That's like a comic uh, convention where you reference something that already had, it's, a, it's called a callback. Anyway, <laughs> but you made this decision to try to help other people. You said, I learned all this stuff. Now I want to go out and help other people in the e-commerce space use the things that I've learned, right? So when you think about conversions and all the things that you've learned, 
like what is the and i hate this type of thing but what is like what are some of the main things that someone should think about when they're trying to build their e-commerce business yeah i think the 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 most crucial thing which is neglected by almost everyone is to to think that they already have product market fit because they are product centric so they start with the product and not with the struggles that the the customers have and eventually they they ignore the fact that there are, over there there are human beings which are having feelings emotions expectations and struggles and they need to solve this kind of struggles and desires they and and I think if they don't get that from the very beginning, they end up throwing a lot of products, looking on the company journey rather than on the customer journey. So I think that's the most crucial thing. And I, I see this as a recurring theme because I, I have uh, fallen into the same trap as well. So that, that's one thing. Another thing is the mathematical model of the business. We have this enthusiasm as uh, as entrepreneurs. We have the, the drive. Maybe we are good sales guys. We are converting uh, people into employees or uh, traffic into conversions. But if we don't get the formula right and the e-commerce growth formula, I think it's it, it's being uh, let's say twisted by the media companies more towards acquisition rather than the whole customer uh, lifetime value. And uh, that's the mathematical model be behind the, uh, an e-commerce growth. And that, that's being ignored because most of the uh, professionals and the media is telling you, you need traffic, you need AOV, you need conversion rate, and that's it. But actually, it's uh, how much you pay to acquire a customer and how much you get throughout the entire life of that customer. And I think this, uh, this is being ignored. Customer lifetime value versus customer acquisition cost versus the volumes. Uh, that's the second thing. Yeah. So both of you had said something actually really interesting. Martin referenced it first. You followed up on this and this idea that like there are real humans with real emotions and real desires and actually real struggles on the other side of whatever product you're trying to sell them or whatever service you're trying to give them. And yeah. I, I like to make offline equivalencies and tell me where I'm wrong here. But if I go into a, even the best restaurant in the whole world, if the food is amazing, even if the price is expensive, if the service is just a little bit bad, I'm not going back. I'm just not going back because I can get food almost as good with way better service. And I look at this and I always talk to like a, a date or my wife or whatever it is when I'm there and just say, they're not understanding like that. They're not trying to take my money once mm -hmm. that if they're just a little bit better at this, I'll come back all the time. Like there was a little Italian restaurant <clears throat> in my neighborhood in Tokyo. We used it as like a, like a cafeteria. Yeah. Any night that we didn't want to cook at home, we just went there. The lifetime value was insane. <laughs> Is that the same thing that you're talking about? Yeah, exactly. I mean, th those kind of principles are being ignored. And I think this is uh, uh, since the beginning of trade itself, under promise and over deliver, this principle is being ignored. And if you don't over deliver, just a bit is not like you, you need to go out of business to, to over deliver. Right. If you don't do that, you are not sticking into the minds of the customers. And right now, the customers, we are more powerful than ever because we have access to, I don't know, plenty of other options, right? It's not like you can't find things only from this store or from that store. It's not that anymore. So the, the battle is now on the customer experience arena, is not on the marketing side or on the price side anymore. And and I, I completely agree with you, and I'm so glad that you say that because you you put word on the feeling that I have within myself from like months, <laughs> let's say, <laughs> that you know, like working with with online sellers as well. And I see them always, you know, like trying to to reduce basically their customer acquisition costs. And that's the only thing they try to do like you know like get cheaper ads and get cheaper clicks and get mm -hmm. cheaper conversion and they completely forgot to work on the lifetime value of our customers by launching new products or you know like by by doing some other kind of stuff so is it fair to say that that if you can focus on the on the lifetime value of the customer then you can 
you can acquire a customer at a higher cost. And at the end of the day, is a company that is going to be able to acquire the customer at a higher cost that might win because they can less pay a lot of ads and much more than every, every, everybody else. So is, is, is it fair to say that instead of trying to get the customer at the cheapest cost, we should try to be able to acquire them at the higher cost? I, I think it's uh, it's right, but it's depending on the on the products that you're that you're selling because it depends on the industry and how crowded it is that uh, that that industry, Martin. But for sure, if you are hypnotized about decreasing the customer acquisition cost, you will end up doing like what I call black CRO, right? You do this kind of traps, this wheel of fortune, this these things, which are affecting your brand's value, and you end up focusing on uh, orders, not on customers. So mainly you are not going to be customer centric it's if all you are doing is to uh, focus on decreasing the customer acquisition cost. Now, the paradox is that if you focus on increasing the customer lifetime value, you will learn more about your customers. Learning more about your customers will allow you to position your products better, to fine tune right. your messaging, to, to use how they verbalize the, the reasons why they are buying from you in your ads. And that's going to decrease the customer acquisition cost. For sure. For sure. Can yeah, I, that's a shift of mindset. Sorry, you two probably understand this, but I don't know what black <laughs> CRO is. I really want to know. Yeah. So black CRO, I think... Uh, uh, what does yeah, CRO mean? CRO means conversion rate optimization. Yeah. Go ahead. So I, what's black conversion rate optimization? Is when you are persuading your customers to do things that will generate the buyer's remorse eventually, right? Ah. You bribe them into buying stuff. You are, let's say, hiding stuff from, from them so that they eventually make the purchase without telling the whole truth or by using things like uh, instant gratification or small dopamine kicks where, and eventually they have this... Uh, cognitive dissonance, right? They do something, but then they will regret it. Or they do something and they, they, they actually don't want that product. And we are fluted with the products that we don't use, right? In, in the US, they keep the tags after they buy the clothes. And, and it's that saying that you don't, uh, you, you haven't finished the purchase until you, 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 you cut off the tag because right, you right, can right. always return it. So mainly, that's going to end up in a high return, uh, uh, return rate, which is going to affect the business because if the returns are for free, maybe you, uh, you increase the conversion rate, but you also increase the return rate and eventually the company is being harmed by this black CRO thing. So can we break this down though? Like I said, offline, right? You go into a restaurant, you get incredible service. I would make the case that you can go to a restaurant where the food is even slightly worse, but feel like you're having a better experience and even pay more just because you feel better about it. But how does that man itself manifest itself online for online sales, right? Let's leave the black CRO off to the side. Yeah. How do you do this in a way digitally, right? That makes people feel better, not have buyer's remorse. Like what are some of the things that, that are the right thing to do and not the wrong thing to do? Yeah, I think the, the, the right thing to do is to collect zero party data. So to, to understand, let's say you have a shop which is selling toys, right? Okay. If you collect zero party data, things like, who are you buying this toy for? It's for my kid, it's, for, it's, a, it's as a gift, it's not a gift. So getting collecting this kind of data will allow you to guide the customer and to personalize the customer journey towards what they actually need because you can build, uh, let's say, collections only for gifts for boys which are between 9 and 11 years old. And then you use this kind of data afterwards so that you make yourself useful to the customer because you, you can ask something like, when is the, the next anniversary for, for this kid? I mean, you want to buy something for Christmas too? Uh, and you want us to remind you about this? Be and that's actually useful. That's, that's the kind of information that I want to share and I feel it as being useful. And that's the right thing to do as a company. And how do you get this data? Do you do, you, do, you do surveys? Do you do email campaign? Like what is, what is the process? 
Yeah, pretty much surveys plus emails plus uh, remarketing uh, remarketing ads. We have a uh, we have a methodology. I mean, I've developed uh, in the last fifteen years. It's called customer value optimization methodology, CVO. And uh, the idea is that you need to collect zero party data pre-purchase, use it so that you can convert the customers better and use it to remarket the customers, showing them the right products for what they need. And then you use it on the email onboarding right after they place the order so that you, you are relevant. A lot of companies are bombarding their customers with discounts right away. You know, and, and they are not even asking their customers, hey, was that all right? Are the shoes fitting you? Do you like them? They, right. they don't do this this simple thing, which in, 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 in the normal life, the, the entrepreneurs are doing it. I mean, small companies can teach a lot of uh, retailers about how to do how to do business. But that, that's, that's very interesting because you say you're doing that pre-sales. Like I, I understand you want to do surveys and all of that post-sales, like post purchase like once they buy we want to know like why they buy and for who they bought this toy and stuff like that so then we can understand better of the next customers but doing that pre-sales is is different and if you do that pre-sale uh maybe like are you not scared that it can get the conversion rates down actually because instead of buying people can do something else and we want them to buy instead but isn't isn't and can i just jump in here for a second valentine isn't what he's saying is that you don't want actually someone to buy something that they don't want later so that if you do it pre-sales and they don't buy, maybe it's actually better longer term. Does that make sense? You know what I mean, Martin? So like if I walk in, cause I, like I bought these training shoes like three months ago and they hurt my feet. So like, it's hard for me to do the exercise that I want to do. And I'm like, ah, oh. and returning them's a pain and all this other stuff. Do you know what I mean? So if the pre-sales had been better, I'd go buy and like buy the training shorts and the training shirt and stuff. But now I'm just like, oh, it's so uncomfortable. Is, is that the right thought process, Valentin? Yeah, exactly. You want, you want happy customers because at the end of the day, happiness is uh, what they are after. They want satisfaction. Nobody wants to have bad emotions. And we are, we're, all, we're all in this dance between pain and pleasure. You know, We are all <laughs> going to, towards the pleasure and running out from, from pain. And depending on the company that you're building, you need to understand if you're selling vitamins or if, if you're selling painkillers, because if you understand that, you, you will know how to position your, your, your products. And understanding how to position your products will lead to happy customers because you will actually be useful. You, you want a company which is not tricking customers into buying stuff they don't need and polluting the planet more than it, it was. You want to have an ethical business and you want to grow through the network effect because you have satisfied customers. Let me tell you about a crazy idea that I had uh, 2011. Go for a it. Huge, a huge competitor got into the market of insurance. I mean, the main player. Imagine that Amazon got into the insurance uh, uh, in, uh, vertical. Oh, no. And, yeah. <laughs> and uh, the, the local player over here. So we thought, what, what can we do? So they were not only that they were entering the market, but they were playing the discount uh, uh, dance. You know, they, they were right. practically eroding completely their margin and they were promising something like come to us and uh, we're going to give you 15 percent discount. <clears throat> and we we couldn't have a business anymore. I mean, if we right. were getting into that, our our margin was was around 19 uh, percent. So from four percent, we couldn't survive as a company so what we we done at that moment we thought of, of what we are actually selling we are selling peace of mind insurance drivers what they are let's say if we if we think about it what our customers are cheering uh, are, are, are cherishing more than uh, than money and we we had a saying here in romania is money or life you know it's a it's a it's a saying here <laughs> what do you want? I mean, if someone is going to give you $1 million today, but you're not going to have a day to live tomorrow, you will be happy that you got $1 million, but you are going to be more happy if you're going to live another day. So eventually life is uh, more important than money. So right. we teamed up with the, uh, with the guy, which is an authority here about defensive driving, you know, and we build a course and we name it 
named it. I mean, we filmed it. We got there with the director. We we made something like on a DVD because at that moment the <laughs> DVDs were actually a thing. And That's we, we we don't, built this don't... course. Yeah, don't talk to Martin about DVDs. He has no idea. <laughs> anyway, go ahead, Valentine. Yeah, so we built a course and we named it the course which can save your life. And it right. was free for any order. And the, the idea is that we actually haven't lost any customer and we got something like a 35% year-over-year growth when they launched it and the price was way different, way, way better than ours. So uh, eventually... Those kind of things can improve the the uh, the life of the customer, and it, it's about the job to be done. You know, what's the job to be done by your product? Why are the customers uh, buying your products, and how can you help them make progress in their lives? Because if you help them make progress, then they they will be yours. That is that is a very great example. I love this example uh, from your from your previous company. That you are more expensive, but you're creating something new that you offer to your customer if they if, if they stay with you, and then you grew the business at the end of the day. <laughs> like, yeah. and it's not like you lose business; it's that you you grew your business and like pretty pretty decently. And yeah, that's a, that's an awesome example. I love it. <laughs> Do you think that? What's the right word? Like the mindset of people that are building e-commerce businesses has to veer away from all of the stuff that they're getting bombarded with by, you said, like by the media mm -hmm. that are telling them to focus on whether it's cost of acquisition or any of these other things, right? And I love this idea. You use this term, which was really great. Is it the company journey or is it the customer journey? It almost sounds like it's the same thing, but they're really polar opposites at some level, right? But do you think there's a mindset change that needs to take place for the e-commerce entrepreneur to be able to like figure out what they're really supposed to do and not what everybody else is telling them to do? Yeah, for, for sure, man. I mean, uh, I'm seeing all these, uh, let's say, advices and tips and uh, e-commerce, it's a work in progress. It's not done. I mean, it's clear that in the next 10 years, this is going to be way more uh, <laughs> higher and impactful than it is right now. I mean, we're, we're just starting at off. At the beginning. As, we're just yeah, at the beginning of this. That's yeah. the world tagline of, of the show. E-commerce is not solved yet. Yeah, <laughs> so that's we cannot the whole reason for the show. So I love it. <laughs> Go ahead. We cannot agree more. <laughs> yeah. And, and I think we, are, we don't have the proper education. So we don't have the pillars of how to grow an e-commerce, how to build, how to establish an e-commerce, what's What's your purpose in the life of, of the customers? And most of the e-commerce experts and professionals are, are, are being hypnotized and are being drawn into the game, in the, into the customer lifetime value optimization game of Facebook or, and of uh, Google Analytics, of yeah. Google AdWords, which are, let's say, hypnotizing like, uh, like that uh, snake in uh, Jungle Book, you know? They are, mm -hmm. they are hypnotizing everyone around tweaking CPCs, CTRs, making those type of, of things. But eventually what I think we, we are all disregarding as an industry is the ability to listen to your customers, to do customer research, to understand what you're selling. It was, I, I think there are 70 years now since Peter Drucker said that most of the companies don't know why their customers are buying their products. And right. I think that's still the reality at, at this moment. But so this is really interesting. We talked about this. So I really want to dig deeper here. You can get feedback directly from these emoting humans in a face-to-face -face interaction. But in the digital world, how do you get that feedback? Right? Because yeah. every time I buy something, I don't want to fill out a survey. I hate these online polls. It drives <laughs> me crazy. And it's just happening everywhere. But if I'm yeah. in a store or if I'm in a restaurant, I can literally have a conversation that sounds like it's authentic and organic, yes. but it's really just the salesperson trying to get information about me from me. Like, hey, why are all the shirts you buy are black? Like, it's just kind of strange, right? <laughs> and you're like, do you know what I mean? You're like, well, I just love Steve Jobs and everything he does, I have to do. And once they know that, you know what I mean though, right? Like you can, they can get yeah. stuff from people without asking explicitly, but how do you do that online? 
Yeah, I, I can tell you my, my whole methodology. It's going to be a bit technical, but it's crafted throughout the year. So the first, thing that, the first thing that we are doing is called RFM segmentation. Yeah, recency, frequency, monetary value. So we segment customers according to how recently they've bought, how frequently they've bought, and what's their customer lifetime value or monetary value. After doing that, we will end up having different clusters of customers. Some of them, we call them soulmates, the best customers out there. So the ones which are buying over and over again, it's you, Michael, for the Italian restaurant in Tokyo. Yeah. <laughs> you are a super consumer. You, you have the ingredients. You are the golden goose that they are after, right? So after doing that, after we identify the ideal customers, uh, from a single, from a, from a company, we go out there and we pick up the phone and we convince them, persuade them into having in-depth interviews so that we understand the underlying reasons why they are buying, what makes them say, These are my, this is my favorite store. From them, I want to buy again, over and over again. Because right. and if you don't do this in-depth interview, you will have like shallow responses with the surveys but before doing the, the shallow re, uh, surveys you need to understand which are the options yeah why are you buying this so you go out there we apply a methodology called jobs to be done and we interview seven to ten of the best customers and then we understand the jobs to be done for instance uh, we've made this for a for a store called uh, hush blankets they are selling weighted blankets it's a company from canada they thought that they are selling this for the cuddling effect uh, that you have when you are uh, in front of the TV. Right. After doing this, I, I personally made this uh, these interviews at the, a, a, as part of my training because I, I was uh, I, I'm a learner. I'm a continuous learner. I want to understand what we are what we are doing, what we are building. So I made these interviews, and they were real people with medical conditions which were buying the weighted blankets not for the cuddling effect, but because they had insomnia and they couldn't sleep. If they got sleeping pills, they were being knocked out. So imagine that right. you need to take care about the kid and uh, you can't sleep. Mm -hmm. If you get yeah, your yeah. pill, you can't wake up during the night. So that's actually dangerous. So It's very bad. Yeah. So eventually we understand that that's one job that they were completely ignoring. And they, in all their marketing, they were selling things about the cuddling effect, but it was actually like a therapeutic uh, cure for, for, for their customers. Said so we identified four different jobs. Two of them, they weren't aware of that completely. I mean, they, they haven't knew that they, those were jobs to be done by their products. And then they qualified, they've started to change the messaging, the advertising, the positioning of the brand and so on. So that's my methodology. That's how you are, you are getting to, to, to understand what makes them say, I'm going to buy from this store, not from this one? Yeah, sorry. It's so interesting, Martin. Did I interrupt you? Go ahead if you no, have no, something no, no. you want to say. No, 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 no. It's, it's because, like, I I completely agree with you that we, that we should definitely listen to the customers and, you know, like, know why they buy and also who bought and, you know, what they do with, with the product and, and all of that. But most of the time, it's very hard to do that. Like, we want to do that, and it's not like... It's not super simple, but like from what I understand from what you say is that you created a framework, a system to help any company yeah. to do that and just follow what you created first for yourself, but then they can learn from you and use your system to implement that into your company, right? Exactly, yeah. We actually created this methodology and also we are now educating other agencies. So mainly we, we as a company, we have three, three different business lines. We are producing software, we are serving the best customers, offering them services, yeah, professional services. We have a consulting arm of 25 people which are actually doing the work, right? Working with real, real customers. And third, we are uh, giving away education. So we, this year, we've launched our own CVO Academy and we are training other agencies to offer this kind of services because we think that agencies uh, are so narrow-minded and all they do, they, some of them are only tweaking the bids, you know, and then are, are sending the report to their uh, customers and pretty much that's it. And they need to be data-driven. They need to understand who's the, cu the, the customer of the e-commerce company that they are serving. 
completely agree with you. Go, what go is this? ahead, Michael. <laughs> yeah, so I, I'm, I'm always curious about the sales reaction, right? In other words, you go to an e-commerce seller, they've been doing this for a few years in their own mind, right? They just, they know their product, they know their business, they know their clients way better than you, right? So you rock up and you tell them, hey, you know, I think we should change the way you think about, the, the, not just the way you're acquiring clients, but the way you serve them. Do you know what I mean? And as soon as you start the conversation, they must just look at you and just be like, oh God, can you please be quiet? I've been doing this for years. You have no idea what you're talking about. What's the, but you know what I mean though, right? Because you've had yeah, that. Yeah, 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 of course. What, what's the, what's the, like the epiphany or the realization that they get when you come back with this data and you say to them, you know, the reason why people are actually buying this product is because it's therapeutic for them. Not only yep. can they sleep better, but it makes them feel better and feel safer. And if you emphasize that, like that's the thing you want to give them. Do you know what I mean? Like yep. what is that sales cycle like where they finally realize that what you're saying is actually true? Yeah, it's a, uh, it, it's a resistance. I mean, it, it's clear that they, they, because that means changing their behavior. And as you definitely know, we're all, all in the game of changing behaviors ours right. and uh, the people around us that that's what we need to do and uh, usually we are backing up with data so mainly after doing this type of in-depth research we can say with we uh, with the with more than 99% statistical significance that 60% of your revenue throughout the entire life of your store has been generated by job number 2 and that's the data you can look around if you want to, uh, let's say, have a debate about it, that's great. You'll have, a, you'll, you'll have a, an opinion. But that's what data, data uh, has, is telling us. And in order to convince them, it's pretty easy because they are struggling. A lot of e-commerce companies are struggling. I mean, a lot of e-commerce entrepreneurs are struggling. They are in the game of decreasing customer acquisition costs, acquiring more customers and decreasing their costs. And the ROAS has gone off the roof after the new cookie dance, you know, because the internet giants are not interested to serve cookies anymore. And now their, their uh, efficiency, their marketing uh, spending efficiency is going down. So they need to find a solution. And one of the solutions is this one. Why don't we listen to, your, to our customers? Why, why don't we focus on the ideal customers? Why can't we stop acquiring bad customers because if you look with the RFN segmentation for instance 30% of the customers are toxic right you spend more to acquire them if you look at the data you you spend $20 to acquire them and your margin can be like eight, 18 or $19 so that means you right. you are losing money for every transaction yeah and i i have a question regarding that um I feel that the awareness of e-commerce sellers regarding how they can uh, improve their stores is really, really low uh, regarding what you are doing, basically. Like, like as you said, and what and as what I see as well uh, on on my side is that everybody try to reduce cost and you know treat the little <laughs> the little figures on Facebook and Google, right? So they they naturally goes to agencies that does that, right? So from yeah. your point of view, do you see that the market mindset is changing? Do you see that we have more and more awareness? Do you have inbound leads at the end of the day? Or is it yeah. still super hard to get customers and you have to fight and like uh, like outbound to them and stuff, stuff, stuff like that? Yeah, for, for us, it's uh, it's much more easier than it was uh, three years ago when we've started with this. I mean, for, okay. for sure, the awareness, because when everything is going okay, you don't want to change things, right? You just want to tweak around things. You don't want to do radical changes. And right. what we are proposing is a radical change. We are saying mm -hmm. you've been doing this wrong for your entire <laughs> life of your company. Stop, <laughs> listen to your customers, change everything. And it's not mm -hmm. easy to chew, but when you're struggling, when you are in danger, when you are looking and you're realizing that your business model might not work anymore because of this ROAS versus uh, what it is and versus your margin, then you, you look for solutions. And one of the solutions is this one. There are other solutions as well, but I don't know. We, we, we were doing our, our own research with the jobs to be done. We, we just finished it two months, uh, two months ago. And we realized, 
hey, we have three types of customers. The ones which are uh, feeling that their business might go off rails in a few months from now, and they want to analyze things like customer lifetime value, whatever. We have customers that got it and they are really sophisticated and we are giving them the tools and the means to, to do even more stuff. And we have customers which are just getting it. They, are, they, they want to know what's their NPS score. They want to, I mean, they feel like they are a fraud. They, are, they have this imposter syndrome and they are just getting into the e-commerce space and they don't know what's NPS, what's CLV, what's uh, average days between transactions, all these terms, and they, they want to learn. So mainly that's how the market is unfolding. And we are mainly, I, I'm, I have a vested interest here, but if uh, the companies are not going to, to start getting the, the game that they are playing, they, they will simply vanish because 44% of the total e-commerce company, uh, websites which are live right now have been built in the last 12 months alone. So the competition is fantastic. You know, if you can look you, at can you say that can you say that again? Did you yeah, say that forty four percent of the websites that are built for e commerce were built in the last twelve months? Yeah, exactly. It's because it's because dirt that dirt exploded the last twelve months. That's why <laughs> everybody treated the website. <laughs> I'm kidding. Yeah. But yeah, that's insane. That's, that's insane. insane, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so go ahead. I I interrupted you. So every offline retailer has built a, 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 mm -hmm. a website, you know? If it was nice to have a, a, until now, it was like one, two, five, eight percent maximum of, of the total business was, was e-commerce, right. so it wasn't appealing. But right now, the spike was 27% of all the retail from the US was online. 40% of the retail from the UK was online this year. So mainly when you are seeing that almost half of your business, you are not getting that. You need to that you need to change that. So the, there is a there is a flood of new customers entering the market, and the, let's say the good news is that the small and the very small players are the ones leading the market. So mainly according to statistics, seventy percent, almost seventy percent of all the sales in the last twelve months uh, on the CPG right C consumer packet uh, packed goods were. Uh, being done by small and very small players. And that's that's good for the economy because I love entrepreneurship and I love the small players. I, I don't think it's healthy to have only Amazon and that's it. Yeah, neither do I. I'm curious about your view of these big marketplaces, you know, in our in, in my region, normally I would say our region, but you know, Martin has gone to France not to bring home champagne for the rest of us. It's a little selfish, but we'll let him get away with it. I'm, but, I'm French, Michael. I'm French, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> but putting that aside, you know, these big e-commerce companies like Shopee and Lazada and Zalora yeah. and all these like online companies. But what's your view on the idea of marketplaces versus these sort of individual proprietors? And where do you think that market is going? So you gave some great sort of surprising statistics about where the growth is. Some of that obviously is COVID related, right? Because people couldn't yeah. go to the store. So they said, well, we still have stuff to sell. People are still buying things. So we need yeah. to be online now before we didn't think we did. I think it's sustainable, but I'm curious what you think it is from your perspective. Uh, I I have seen some uh, some data, and it's clear that in uh, in Asia there are less players per capita than there are in the U.S. market and uh, in sure. the European market and in Australia. So I I think is uh, I don't know why is this happening, but it's clear that the the marketplaces are winning more easily in the uh, in Asia than are in the the other places of the world. I think it's all about the uh, the let's say capacity, the entrepreneurial capacity of the ones which are launching this type of uh, this type of stores. The the knowledge is growing. Uh, the access to technology is much more easier. You have access to data, and it's way more cheaper to launch a website than it was ten years ago. So it's for sure the, the game is not about launching it. You know, not the but the game is how to execute it how to do it, how to make it happen. You know, the, the, the messy middle is the challenge. So at this moment, I, I can't bet on something. 
uh, I can bet on something. I would love to to see a competitive landscape, and I would love to see uh, very professional and niched uh, companies which are making it happen. But uh, the 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 game is still playing, so we uh, I can't foresee how is this going to be unfolding in the future. That's maybe Shopify, sorry, maybe Shopify will do a will do this movement of actually building a, 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 a floating marketplace and uh, giving access to their merchants so that they will compete with Amazon. But that's for the mostly for the Western market. What's a floating marketplace? So I, I foresee it without being needed to operate. You know, you are not operating at all. You, you are just giving access to a, a, a website, you know, to a centralized website where you can uh, put on your, uh, your, your goods but you you don't have to uh, to to pay to play like Amazon is doing. Yeah, so I don't disagree with you. I mean, I think I don't disagree with you. But here's the thing, and Martin's heard me say this a bunch of times, and people that listen to the show have heard me say this as well. I think in the old days, you and let's just do this in the digital world. You had individual shops that were just operating on their own. Amazon is really the department store, just like Shopee and Lazada, they're a department store. But what happens at these department stores is that they're so focused on product growth, having all the products in the world, right? That yeah. discovery becomes hard. So I cannot find the best shoes. I cannot find the best shirts. I can't find the best neckties. So yeah. I'm, I want somebody to be outside of that marketplace, outside of that department store, so that discovery becomes easier for me. Again, we saw this in the offline world. And I think, <clears throat> and I think you're partly corroborating this, that we're starting to see that in the online world as well, where the buyers are having more leverage and the sellers are figuring out, I need to understand exactly what my clients want and to make discovery better for them, I don't have to be on these sort of monolithic marketplaces. Does that yeah. all make sense? Yeah, of course. And uh, because it, the the diversity has has a point from where onwards you are being overwhelmed with options, and right. the the idea that you can choose from two hundred SKUs, it's much more uh, easy to to digest than if you need to uh, get uh, to select from twenty thousand SKUs because it's or two million, yeah. The friction is 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 too too high. Uh, on the functional aspect, I think we, we've all seen that it was something like 11%, I don't know exactly, 11% from uh, the, uh, the goods sold by, by Amazon were private label made by them. So maybe they are competing with their, their vendors. And eventually, right. maybe the vendors, maybe the merchants will realize, hey, we are going to get out of business if we mm -hmm. continue to be uh, to, to to play this uh, this game because they are selling headphones, they are selling mattresses, they are selling a lot of stuff, you know? <laughs> but here's, and here's what I think is happening. And again, tell me where I'm wrong here. Let's say I'm a mattress seller or a headphone seller, just as you suggest, and I join Amazon's marketplace. They're getting all this data on the products that are selling because I've decided to sell them on their marketplace. And then they're disintermediating me by saying, I don't care. Yeah, I know that if I sell a mattress and the mattress sellers that are on my marketplace don't sell sheets and towels and all these other things, but I can make a profit selling sheets and towels so I can sell mattresses at a loss. And I know which ones are selling because that team over there has already told me what it is. So let's just get rid of them and yeah. underprice them. Right. So it's almost like they're using their own sellers as a test bed for their white label products that are going to work. Is that happening? Yeah, of course it's happening, and uh, there are there are merchants which are 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 simply delisting themselves from from Amazon, and we've been I think seeing so. that. Yeah, and Nike, by the way, he he got out from from Amazon, and they they yep. are playing this direct to consumer play. So brands are getting it, and I think uh, another aspect which is crucially important is that if you don't own the relationship, then you're lost. I mean, eventually, if I if I'm just selling through Amazon, I can always get uh, be be. Uh, left be get left behind by them because they simply say they they cut off from from uh, from from their uh, from their environment. So you will be out of business. You will be getting some money, but eventually you don't have the connection uh, be, between you and the the consumers. And 
if you have that connection, and that's what I, I was selling, saying about uh, Shopify's movement towards a marketplace, if you let the merchants own the relationship, then you will actually be in a much more better position and you will be more, more appealing as an option for the, for the merchants. Right. For sure, I think that's a, that's a huge disadvantage when you sell on, on, on marketplaces like Amazon is that you don't own the customer at all. You cannot talk to them, you cannot email them, you cannot put a gift card into the yeah. box, like you cannot do anything, right? So do you have customers who are selling on uh, Amazon yourself? I guess, no, I guess you are only doing DTC, right? Yeah, yeah, we are doing D to C, but also there are brands which are also selling on uh, on Amazon. We have okay. brands which are have made this experiment and then they've delisted their products. So I, I've been seeing a lot of stories, but I, I'm at this moment the trend is to own your own channel because it's like having your own radio station. You don't have I to agree. pay for advertising. I agree. So the last thing I want to ask you, and it's crescendoed perfectly this whole conversation into one of the things that both fascinates me and befuddles me at the same time. What's your view on companies like Thrasio and these other Amazon consolidators? Do they really know more than like the rest of us about how to scale these businesses? Or is this just like a scheme to raise a ton of money and then sell to others? Do you know what I mean? Like, what's your yeah, view on this? Yes. Uh, I think they uh, they are already threatened. I mean, I, I've been reading a, a, a few articles uh, about them. Uh, what I do know for a fact, because uh, uh, one of our uh, one one of our merchants were uh, ha has been into into a conversation to get acquired by them, is that they are launching a lot of stuff. So maybe they they're they are doing spray and pray. This type of consolidation that they are trying to do is not working because the synergies are not always there. There, yeah. And uh, eventually you have a lot of money to experiment. You can, you can be data-driven or not. And it's a difference between being data-driven and data-informed. And, uh, 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 and another thing is that you can be lied by the data, right? You, it's also, we have our minds with our emotional filters and eventually it's how we interpret the data. But uh, at this moment, I don't think that this type of uh, business model uh, is going to thrive if they are not going to find real synergies between the merchants. Because at the end of the day, that's their secret sauce that they are claiming right. they have. Yeah. That's that's interesting because we just released an episode with uh, TJ Highland from Elevate Brands, which is like one of the biggest uh, ag aggregators. And they yeah. were saying exactly that they did not look for synergies between brands, but it was way too hard to do uh, at this point. Like they, they were not they were not looking to do that, and also because they don't own the customers, like they, they, they don't have access, so they cannot resell. You know, for example, if you sell mattress, they cannot sell blankets because they just don't have the, 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 the customers, right? So it completely makes sense with what you say, is that this kind of stuff we cannot do it at this point because uh because yeah that, that just does, does not work for now yeah the, their bet is let's acquire some sellers on amazon which are doing yeah. great let's help them build their direct to consumer let's use the joint audiences so that we can grow all of them and let's uh, mm -hmm. forget about amazon in i don't know five years from now that i, I guess that's that's their game the trap is that maybe there are products which can be sold only through Amazon because they have this kind of synergies. You know, they know that maybe. this type of product can be uh, associated with other products in, into the same basket. Interesting. <laughs> Very interesting. Interesting. Okay. Awesome. I think it's almost, I think it's almost time to let you go. Valentin Radu, the founder and CEO of Omni Convert, the guy with the best like camera, microphone, Set up. laptop, desk, <laughs> <laughs> shelf setup I've ever seen in any of the videos I've ever done. Thank you so much for doing this today. I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you as well, Michael. And thanks, Martin. And thanks, everyone, for uh, listening to, to us today. Thank you, Valentin. Bye-bye.